Hey there, welcome back to Marketing Matchmaker. I am super excited about today's episode. So I have our friend Paul Zolman on today. Paul is the author of Love is God. In his wisdom, he placed us in a variety of circumstances that require us to find our way back to his pure love. So what qualifies Paul to speak about love? His childhood experience of the opposite of love. From the Astor beginning and the distaste it formed inside of him, he searched for and eventually created a method that transformed his life from anger to loving everyone. Growing up in a family of abuse, physical touch became his preferred love style only because of the regularity. He could almost count on it. It was consistent. He came to think that was the way to express love, but deep inside, he knew that was a twisted belief. He wanted a better life for himself, which is why he created a paradigm shift that works. In his book, you'll find what helped Paul move from a childhood boot camp of abuse to being a person who loves everyone and can find good about anyone in any circumstances. This truly is the role of love. <clears throat> Thank you for joining me today, Paul. I love your background and your story and the perspective that you have on love and God and really creating something new from, from a history of abuse. So let's start with, tell the audience who you are, what you do and who you serve. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. to be with you today. Um, I, as, as you mentioned already, grew up in a, a angry family. Part of that angry uh, culture was that there were no boundaries. You could do anything, anything goes. Uh, you could walk over people while they're talking. In fact, most of the time, you'll find people in, from an angry culture that'll start talking even when someone else is talking, thinking that what they have to say is a whole lot more important than what anybody else is saying. There's no courtesy. There's no respect there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, just overlap of of going over the fence, looking over the fence, looking at what other people are doing, thinking they have the ability to criticize that other person, thinking they're better, and therefore they can put that other person down. A lot of put downs, a lot of that type of behavior. I really just did not want that in my life anymore. And so I, just like any teenager, I don't know if you have teenagers, I Jennifer. Do. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but just like any teenager at age 17 or 18, they always make this vow that they're going to be better than whatever their parents did. Even if they're good parents, even if their parents were great, uh, they're going to be better than what they did. I also made that vow and actually moved out of my house, uh, out of my my home when I was um, 17 after my junior year of high school and moved and lived with my brother. He had two two small children. He's an older brother. I'm number ten of eleven children, so he's an older brother, and and he just had these two small children. I played with the children. I didn't have any younger siblings like that to play with. My younger sister is only a year difference, so she, it's not like I had babies to play with when I was growing up. So it was really fun for me to play with these babies and try to learn the soft culture. I grew up in that harsh culture, and learning that soft culture was just it was eye-opening for me and obviously made made mistakes and uh, my brother just had, but I noticed my brother had the same patterns as like my father did. And I'm pretty sure this must've been generational. Right. But what we would do is we would stack one annoyance on top of another, on top of another, until we had this flash of anger. You never would know, Jennifer, when that flash of anger would happen. So just trying to, it could happen in public, it could happen in private, could happen everywhere. And it's kind of like, uh, it's like that person in the swimming pool, Jennifer, that has an accident, all of a sudden everybody's scattering, saying it wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. And there that person is isolated all alone by themselves. Right. I, I did not want to, to continue to repel people like that. I wanted to draw do something that would draw people to me. That's kind of started my journey. Awesome. 
So I know in your book, you talk about flavors of love. Tell us how, what that means and, and how you see true love. True love to me, that's a great question, Jennifer. And true love to me is, is more of a, a giving love away without any regard of it ever coming back your way. And there's no expectations. It's not like what um, Dr. Chapman or others say. That Dr. Chapman says that if everybody has a primary love language, and most people will give that primary love language away in hopes that it'll come right back to them. And it's not uh, it's not like that. So that's reciprocity to me. That's a business transaction or any kind of transaction. If, as long as it's on a transactional level it's not going to get to those higher laws of love. And what I found out is instead of stacking annoyance on top of annoyance to get to that, that anger, I found that it's better to stack kindness on top of kindness on top of kindness to get to the higher laws of love, like charity or compassion or intimacy or, or trust or uh, mercy or forgiveness, empathy or sympathy. Any of those are higher laws of love. And what I what I found as a basis, though, that really it needs to come to the literacy level in, in across in the United States as well as across the world, is that we really need to learn the five love languages or something that would, can be a basis. This is the lower laws of love. This will help get you in the door. This will help you start stacking those kindnesses. We really need to get to that point. And so I found a way to do that. That's awesome. Okay, so. Tell me a little bit about your book and your business and what it is that you're, how you're looking to change the world. What is it? What's that impact that you're looking to make? Great question, Jennifer. And the the thing about it is uh, I didn't really set out to change the world. I set out to change myself. I set out to change that generational pattern of that stacking anger to get to that flash of anger. And I really wasn't looking for anything big to do, but just really kind of turned out something so small, so simple that changed me overnight would, would might be useful to other people. And I found that it really has been. So what I created I, um, as in going through the five love languages, I really like the principles of the five love languages. Dr. Gary Chapman, who published that book in 1992, was a Baptist pastor. And being a Baptist pa pastor, he identified that these actually were things that Christ did in his life. I'm Christian and I wanted to, thought if I could be a little bit more like Jesus Christ, and and maybe not, I'm sure not everyone in your audience is, is Christian, but they, if they are, this is a great pathway to go. But I didn't understand his application. Dr. Chapman, you mean if I guess what Jennifer's love language is and <laughs> cater, cater to that, we're going to be buddies? I'm a bad guesser. It wasn't working so far in my life, and then it, it still wasn't working. It just didn't work for me. The second thing that Dr. Chapman has is that, well, if you take this survey, you'll find out what your love language is. Well, what the heck am I supposed to do with that? Advertise? Hello, Jen. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. For, for a marketer, I, I'm that right? perfect, perfect thing to do. <laughs> Hello, Jennifer. I'm gifts. What do you have for me today? I could make a little badge that says I'm gifts. Gifts is my love language. Here's my Venmo QR code. Send it on. <laughs> and, and you could do just do have some fun with it, right? Right. And, and marketing is fun to, to you, Jennifer, and, yeah. and to others, I'm sure. But that wasn't working either. So I thought, you know what? I Even as dysfunctional as our family was growing up, we played games. And playing games brought our family together. There was still the put downs. There was still... Um, uh, I'm better than you and just all that smack talk and everything. There was still aggressive competition. But even with that, that pulling together, I just remembered as a, as a fond experience. I thought, what if I could make this a game? So I contacted Dr. Chapman and, and asked him if he was licensing those little pictures, the little icons that he had for each one of the love languages. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of weeks, his, his attorney wrote back, said, no, we're not doing that. But yeah. I had a, had a friend that was a copyright a intellectual property attorney in my neighborhood. And he, I told him the story and he said this, he said, theory, like the love language theory is not copyrightable. Right. A application is. 
So they weren't doing it as a game. So I, I took the liberty to make my own icons and make it into a game. So this is what I created here. How fun. It's just a one inch by one inch dice. And, and it all has pictures on it. Every site has a picture. What I'm holding up for those listeners of, of yours is, is the kind of like the Taylor Swift heart that, that, with, that, um, with your hands that you make. But yeah. this heart's just a little bit different. Out of this heart is a little conversation fly out as if the heart is talking. That would represent the love language of the words. The I love you, the compliments, that sort of thing. The next one is a hand holding a hourglass. Hourglass measures time. This would represent right. the love language of time. The next one looks like a, a waiter holding a platter. This would represent service. Next one is just two hands together. It looks like they're holding hands or touching. That way that represents touch. And then the last one is a hand holding a gift. You'll notice they're all hands extended out, holding it. And I realized that through this whole process, Jennifer, that I really don't have control over bidding someone to come love me. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not in charge of them. Right. And, it, it, and following that down a little farther, I'm not even in charge of anybody and their choices. So when I realized that, Jennifer, coming from that background that I came from, that I don't have to be in charge of those choices, of their choices. I don't have to be in charge of looking over the fence, seeing what they're doing, and then being critical about that. It was such a relief. You mean I don't have to manage that? I get to manage myself. Well, that's a lot easier. And I thought I had to manage the whole world and right. had to be, be that critic in the whole world. But I realized that I was looking at what's wrong with that person. Why is that person doing it that way? And, and, the paradigm shift for me is instead of looking at that 10 or 20% of faults or, or, or misgivings of people, I started to look at what's right about that person. What can, how can I love about that person? And I was so busy looking at that 80 or 90% of what's good about that person. I forgot to be annoyed. I, for, <laughs> I, I, for, I forgot to be critical. And it really, that's the paradigm shift I'm talking about. And that's the, the thing that I thought, that was overnight. It just happened overnight. I start focusing on what's right about that person. I don't care about what's wrong with them anymore. And it just was just so powerful and changed me. I thought this might be something that might help other people. So the last side of the dice actually has a hand holding the question mark. Question mark is surprise me. So the, Jennifer, there's two instructions. You roll the dice every day, whatever it lands on, that's the love language practice giving away all day that day to everybody. I created this when I was single and I said, Dr. Chapman, who in the heck am I supposed to love? You said to have a significant other to practice this on. I said, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to love everybody. <laughs> uh, but it worked perfectly for me because I needed that replacement behavior to stop that generational critical eye of looking at what's wrong with people. I needed to practice watching for what's right with people and then focusing on that and, and expressing love. As I'm rolling the die, though, and, and in that genre of love I'm practicing that day, I'm watching for people that light up. When they light up, their eyes get big and they get happy and they smile. And you know what it is for, to light someone up. Yeah. Everybody understands what that is. Watch for that. And you discovered what their primary or their secondary love language is. No longer, Jennifer, do you have to say, excuse me, could we pause this relationship for a moment? Well, have you take this survey so I know how to love you. You don't have to do awkward anymore. I love that. I love that. I mean, I will say, you know, my husband and I did the whole love language thing, you, you know, a decade or two ago when we were um, first married. And I don't know that we've ever actually used it throughout our marriage mm -hmm. so something like this is a very big twist where we can continue to even though i kind of know my lo husband's love language that doesn't mean that i'm always giving it so mm. this dice could help in just having the opportunity to remind yourself no matter you know what their love language is to at least focus on that focus on on sharing that kind of love language that's awesome Absolutely, Jennifer. And what I found that the survey did is it kind of put people in a box. That right. Jennifer, 
because you love tacos, you're going to get tacos every day of your life, every meal of your <laughs> life, for the rest of your life. It's going to get a little bit boring. You're going to want something different. Christmas, you might want a gift. Right. Uh, on, on your birthday, you might want something. So you got to change it up a little bit. I also think I had this conversation not too long ago with a friend of mine about love languages. I think love languages also evolve. I know Dr. Chapman says they mm -hmm. don't like this is yours forever. But I think as people, as humans, as we evolve and change and grow, our love languages, I think, have to follow suit in that, you know, for you, it may have started out as physical touch, but it yeah. may have changed over the years as you grew. It has. And for, for me, it's gone from physical touch. Physical touch is now, you know, secondary. Uh, it's still high priority, but, uh, but it's more the words. Yeah. The words actually mean mean something, and and just just feeling that from someone is uh, really important to me. What I found uh, out about this too is that I really understood a spectrum from where I came from to now where it's where I'm at. That that angry culture has a culture all by itself, and I I realized that I don't didn't want to be a part of that culture. I really needed to distance myself from that culture. And so what I found worked really well was realizing what opposites were and realizing that what would be on the spectrum, what's what would be the on the very other end of the spectrum. Take, for example, the word sarcasm. For me, most people really like sarcasm. It's very funny. There's a lot of comedians that use it. A lot of people right. use it regularly every single day. But it's actually on the angry side of the spectrum. If you consider what would be the opposite of, of sarcasm, maybe words like being genuine, mm -hmm. being authentic, being true. When you put those words side by side, it's almost a really easy choice for some people. Some people say, well, I, I still going to go back to that sarcasm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what the spectrum says. I'm going back to that sarcasm. <laughs> they want to keep that part of the angry culture in them. But most people would be wanting to be more authentic, more genuine, and more true to to the, having their words match their actions. So I love this whole conversation and I'd like to turn it a little bit to what Marketing Matchmaker is all about, which mm -hmm. is your marketing. So tell me how you've been marketing this whole, your book and your your product and, and the whole kind of journey that you're taking people on. Good questions. And, and I'll, I'd like to probably start from the beginning. I started with with the cube or the dice, and I started actually with the this prototype here. It's about two and a half inches by two and a half inches block of wood, and I just laser engraved on this block of wood um, all the love languages. Just uh, yeah. had it done, but you can see how sharp these edges were, and it's and when I tried to roll that on the carpet, it would go thunk thunk, and you can, <laughs> right. I, and I, and I could almost decide well. This is on top today. If it goes thunk thunk, then it's going to be over here. I can it's I could almost make it a weighted die, Jennifer. Right. Well, oh, oh, this is what I want. I want touch today, so I'm going to just I'll go thunk thunk. And I realized that oh, I, I'm the one that had the sharp edges, and it was really kind of uh, uh, something that that uh, just evolved like that. That I wanted to have the edges rounded off. So yeah. I mean, this one this one has the edges rounded off. And as I'm doing that, I'm realizing this is just really kind of impractical to have it be so large and everything. And, but I still needed to roll it every day and find out what is it that I was going to uh, do with this with this dies. And then I took took a couple of years to actually do the the artwork as I'm uh, uh, and then I got the copyright on this in 2017. So I'm taking this die around trying to market it to mental health professionals, thinking that that might be a, a good segue, a good segment of society to introduce it and have them use it in their practices. Hardly any of them, uh, right. there, were, there were a few, but hardly any of them actually decided, yeah, I think I want this in my practice. And just so very few were, were taken in. They thought they knew everything. And yeah. it's just this because they're a doctor or they're a, a mental health therapist or they've got the degrees and they've gone through all their schooling and this, the love languages wasn't part of it. And I don't know if it was the application uh, that Dr. Chapman had that that uh, repelled a lot of these mental health specialists 
but it was just something that they weren't doing. There were a few that actually taught from that, but mm -hmm. just thought this is different and it doesn't quite fit with what I've already prepared, what I've already done. So that wasn't working um, uh, hardly at all. But there was a mental health specialist a, a couple of years ago that said, you know what, I really like this idea. He worked with youth, that, I, but it's it's a little complicated compared to what Dr. Chapman had. It's different. It's different, yeah. en different enough that you're doing it to everybody, not just significant others, but you're loving everybody, practicing the one love, one particular love language every single day, regardless of whether it's your primary love language or not, is practicing that, getting it well-rounded in all five love languages is a whole lot different than what um, Dr. Chapman said right. for, um, for that. So he thought, you need a manual. So he's the, it was him, that mental health uh, uh, therapist, that actually said I should write a book. So that's what I did. I wrote wrote the book and and with the book I thought well some people might want to record what they rolled what opportunities they saw so I created a journal as well nice. inside inside the journal has what you rolled what opportunities you saw to love and what you did about those opportunities it just becomes kind of a love journal something I would have loved to have from my mother or grandmother or or grandfather instead Jennifer I got a journal about the weather, the weather 60 years ago. Who cares what the weather was like 60 years ago? That's right. what I got. So I thought this might be a perfect opportunity for people to be more succinct about what they record and what they leave as a legacy to their children. So I started working, trying to market it that way. I've done trade shows and um, little farmers markets because I wanted that one to one with people just to see what responses. The, the story to me is a little bit long, uh, a little bit lengthy to have in a couple minute conversation at a, at a trade show or at a right. farmer's market or anything like that. So I've, I've tried that. I've tried some social media marketing and, uh, and then the website. That's all I've got going right now. Yeah, it really, I, I honestly think you could probably excel at a book funnel kind of thing where you're because I think you need to hit more of just people everyday people right it's mm -hmm. not it's not the trade shows are are all well and good but um and even therapists I love the idea of using them as uh as partners but I think if you can get the message out to just everybody that is struggling with relationships with understanding relationships with understanding love languages in general, I think you probably have a, a bigger benefit of of really um, getting them there. And also speaking engagements, just saying, getting out there on stage. Besides podcasts, podcasts are an excellent way to reach mm -hmm. larger audiences. Um, but there's all kinds of speaking opportunities out there where you can tell your story and sell your project product from it. I have not done that yet, and, and that, <laughs> that's prob probably something I, I should do. Uh, so far in the last six and a half months, Jennifer, I've done about 215, 220 podcasts, being a guest like this on a, on a podcast, and that's yeah. been a little little bit helpful. I mean, at least the words out there, uh, people access it. What, one thing that I did discover through these trade shows and, and the farmer's market, little, little craft shows like that, was the demographic that more women were very more Absolutely. interested. The, the women from, I mean, even, even the age 14 within the, the high schools in my area, there's uh, three or four high schools in my area and all the high school students are, are learning these love languages. And there are a few that know them backwards and forwards. There are a few that say, oh, I heard that or I had a class about that. Don't remember a thing about it. This is different. Yes. This, this whole idea has helped to, to increase that literacy to the point that there's fluency in love instead of fluency in rage. Everybody in there, everybody knows how to get angry. Just watch TV, just watch the news. <laughs> and and the, that trains you on being angry. And yeah. that's, and, and that, we're trying to just uh, mitigate that a lot yeah. and uh, just try to change that tone. Yeah, I definitely think there's a huge opportunity for for this book and for the dice. I think it's a, a very innovative, innovative, 
inventive way um, to adapt the love languages to you and to um, really exploring how you can love more and better and deeper. So tell my audience, how do they get a hold of you? How do they get your Roll of Love book and, you know, journal and dice? Great question, Jennifer. And for the shameless plug that I do, I just, uh, they can just go to my website. That's probably the easiest. I've got a, a selection, a bundle selection that has the book, the die and the journal all, all together for $29.99. Awesome. It's really a, really a whole lot less than even one therapy session. But as you continue to use it, it's going to be a whole lot more valuable than that that one therapy session too. It's really, a, awesome. really, there are not a lot of tools out there, Jennifer, for loving. There's a lot of tool mechanic tools out there. There's a lot of uh, carpenter tools out there. There's a lot of other kinds of tools out there, but hardly any tools for loving. This really will help you. And everybody likes to make a, a an investment that they put up put a little bit in. They get a lot back. Absolutely. The, the two seconds at the beginning of the day to roll the die sets that that purpose, sets that mantra for the day. You'll have a lot of returns for that. We're doing it that Fantastic. way. Fantastic. So for those of you that are interested in the role of love book and uh, journal and dice, head over to rolloflove.com. I will have these links in the show notes, but head over to rolloflove.com to get your your dice and and take a step into loving yourself and learning to love others thank you paul for being on and for everyone else i will see you on the next episode of marketing matchmaker thank you for listening to the marketing matchmaker podcast if you enjoyed this episode i would love to hear your feedback please head over to apple itunes and leave a review so we can hear from you And if you are a coach, consultant, or online course creator who are looking to grow your business, increase your income, and scale your impact, connect with me at yourmarketingmatchmaker.com. I look forward to hearing from you.